So I just want to welcome everyone here today. Um, we are streaming live from the Sonoma Community Center on the second floor. This is the hand building studio. It's where the resident artist has their space and I'm sitting in here right now. Um, the residency program here at Sonoma Community Center is a six month residency program. We, we select artists from a competitive jury um, of applications. Each year we get anywhere from, I'd say 20 to 40 applications and we get to choose one. We wish we could always choose more than one. And they live and work here for six months to help us run the studio. Um, at the end of the residency, each, each artist gets their own solo exhibition in Gallery 212. It's a beautiful 700 square foot gallery. Um, so it's a pretty significant exhibition. All of the work that is in the show is made here at the center and leading up to that date. Anala's show will be in May. And if we can be open for tours, we'll certainly be open, um, but we're definitely going to do a virtual version of that as well. So we hope you'll come back and visit us in May and see how um, Anala's work has evolved over the, la over the five months. Um, so um, before I turn it over to Anala, I just want to say that she's been here about a month almost a month and she's been great. We just put together an exhibition in the gallery for Ensica and Ensica is the National Conference for Education of Ceramic Arts. So we're really proud to be um, hosting this show called Common Ground. It's 26 artists from Northern California and keep your eyes open because we'll be doing a virtual gallery exhibition tour of that as well coming up. So. Before I hand it over, uh, check out our website for some great programming coming up, classes, uh, fiber arts happy hour, printmaking, music, ceramics, and more. And that's www.sonomacommunitycenter.org. So I'll turn it over to Anela. Um, I'll be operating the cameras and the sound. So if there's any issues, please let me know in the chat. And also if you have any questions for her, I'll be um, asking her during her presentation, asking your questions to her, and then at the end, everyone can unmute yourselves and, and talk to her directly. All right, thank you. I have to watch myself on my computer walk into the frame here. Awesome, hello everyone. It's good to see you all. Thank you for that introduction, Kayla. I'm so happy and grateful to be here and to get to know this wonderful place. Um, and thank you to anyone who is normally a huge part of this community and that I haven't gotten to meet in person um, because of COVID. I hope you know that I appreciate the virtual welcome and I hope to get to know all of you soon. Um, I'd also like to recognize um in talking about being here and being grateful to be here that we're on the unceded territory of um, the southern pomo tribe the wapo and the coastal miwok peoples and i'm just grateful to get to know this beautiful place so i'm going to start with a slideshow of my work just give me a moment to screen share So like I said, my name is Anela and I am currently the resident artist here at Sonoma Ceramics. Um, I like to start all of my artist talks and thinking about my work with this poem that was really one of the beginning texts that started the line of research that has led to the body of work that I'm showing you today. Um, and it's titled Poem About My Right. Suppose it was not here in the city, but down on the beach or far into the woods. And I wanted to go there by myself, thinking about God, all of it, disclosed by the stars and the silence. I could not go and I could not think and I could not stay there alone as I need to be alone because I can't do what I want to do with my own body. And who in the hell set things up like this? 
by June Jordan. So this poem, as well as an essay by Evelyn White about Black women in the wilderness, really started my research into how nature has been socially constructed to exclude people of color in the US. And that was really also to sort of dive into my own personal experiences, um, having moved to northern Michigan and wanting to move through natural space, um, but being constantly confronted with the fact that there were people who owned guns that owned the land that I was moving through. Um, and as someone who is Asian and of Malaysian Chinese descent, um, I definitely stood out and so did my family. So my work is really thinking about how do I reclaim those experiences and what do I do with this information that I don't feel comfortable in these natural spaces that are so important to me and so important to our understanding of diversity and beauty. Um, and so for me, color is a huge part of that. Um, and working with lots of materials that are labor intensive and process, process intensive so that there is the creation of a multi-sensory experience. Um, so this piece here is one of the first handmade paper pieces I made. Um, so these are pours of overbeaten abaca on top of stencils on a sheet of abaca and overbeaten abaca. Um, so I was really thinking about my ceramics practice um, going into learning to make paper. And for me, I feel like ceramics has always just been this sort of um, immediate and necessary thing for me to create things. And it's always been really automatic and I've always like leaned towards really organic forms. Um, so I sort of replicated those in the stencils that I poured over. And the act of pouring is really important to me as well. So these are a few process shots of what it looks like for me to pour. Um, and I think after making, working with handmade paper coming out of a ceramic practice, I was really thinking about the performative nature of the act of pouring, as well as how I use my body in creating um, my works, especially since I was thinking about nature and an environment. How do I create an environment and what sort of feats of myself do I need to give to create a full natural environment? Um, and so the pouring became this really important piece of like really grappling with size. Um, and I started doing that also in my own ceramic practice. So this is a piece um, in progress um, that I'm pouring that same overbeaten abaca, which is a fiber, a paper fiber that's beaten for a very long time. So it's extremely strong and very translucent. Um, and I'm pouring it onto the ceramic vessel as well. So this is the outcome of one of those pieces that was in progress. Um, these are my first foray into paper becoming this large thing for me, this expanse, um, and really thinking not just about these individual moments of growth and natural growth, but then also like what that looks like in a landscape and on a large scale. And all of this work, I, I was working in the ceramic studio at my school, which was the School of the Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts University. And its interdisciplinary nature allowed me to be working um, in the paper studio, in ceramics, as well as working with a fiber artist there and really like investigating what these materials meant to me in my practice. And so it all sort of culminated in the creation of this installation for my BFA thesis which is called Adaptive Cycles. And so it comprises of these overbeaten abaca pores that I started working on like off of a sheet of paper. So these are actually poured onto a thin layer of plastic um, so that they're no longer bound by the confines of a rectangle. Um, and then there's also the ceramic vessels on the floor and the knitted pieces that are hanging. So this is a close up of those overbeaten abaca pores. Um, for me, what paper is, is especially overbeaten abaca is like a conduit for thinking about color and translucency and how these materials play 
with each other and create more of a depth and a celebration of what color can look like um, and really being unapologetic with being colorful and being multifaceted is really important to me in thinking about joy and thinking about the spaces that I create. Um, and for these also, because of the act of pouring, they could be really organic in how they formed these shapes. Like I was manipulating it, but also there was an element of the material being in collaboration with me. And these are just some detail shots of the ceramic vessels. So all of the ceramic pieces also comprised of all of the different materials that were in the installation as a whole. So they were ceramic and then they were spray painted and the overbeam Nabucco was poured over them. Um, and there were also these knitted components that were then felted. Um, so those became sort of soft living organisms growing out of um, the vessel, which became its like house. And then there's starting to be some 3D doodling, um, which you can see here in the details. Um, so those are working with a 3D pen. So it extrudes material um, and really it sort of becomes this foray that I think about a lot more now in my practice um, as it's evolved since this show. Um, as being think being like sort of sci fi futurist understandings of how technology fits into world building and creating and what making can look like. So these are just smaller pieces because I was working so macro um, and then suddenly I was out of school and so I started working on a much smaller scale and trying to find um, ways to find beauty in that and like how I was thinking about landscapes in a smaller scale. Um, so these are just a few ceramic pieces that I created shortly after graduation that have more of an emphasis on those 3D doodles as a part of the pieces themselves. What's the scale of those? Those are like three inches by four inches. Yeah, Kayla asked about the scale if you can hear. Um, so in playing with th the 3D doodling and being at home during COVID, um, I was also thinking a lot about my personal heritage as someone who's mixed race and Malaysian Chinese um, and what role that plays in the imagery that I'm creating. Um, so I started going back into thinking about um, some of the processes um, that come from my culture and part of that is beading. Um, and the tradition of Nonia beading. And so these are um, 3D doodles that then I poured layers of overbeaten abaca on and beaded on top of that and beaded them together and really thinking about like what labor and the hands that have gotten me to the point that I am, what the labor of my ancestors is and how I bring that into thinking about the future and envisioning worlds. So this is another piece that is handmade paper. Um, so these are abaca and cotton mixed sheets of paper that were then connected with overbeaten abaca. Um, and I'll show you, I'm working with that here in the studio. So I've got some around and we'll show you more of that in detail in a moment. Um, and so this is starting to work with batik patterning, which is a huge part of um, Malaysian Chinese textiles and um, just really thinking about what natural imagery I've grown up with that represents my heritage and how that impacts um, the environments that I'm creating and what celebrates that as well um, in considering what natural growth can look like. Yeah, most of mm -hmm. our audience are ceramic people. Yep. Could you give us a sense of Abaca as a material. Yeah, so um, I know you're going to get into that. But yeah, like, actually, I this is probably the easiest way. I have some sheets of processed abaca um, here in the studio. So it's a plant fiber that it's it's in the banana family. And um, so what I do to create overbeaten abaca is to put it into a machine called a Hollander beater, um, which basically just 
grinds it up until it's very, very fine. And so that can take like eight to 10 hours. Um, yeah, and so it's a very strong fiber um, and very translucent and I'm in love with all of its properties um, and its relationship to ceramics as well and how, how they can play together. So um, during this residency, this is the first piece that I've created um, and I'm really starting to think about all of these pieces that I was trying to put together after graduation without a studio um, and this legacy of the work before me, but also like what world building means for me, because I've been creating these environments partially to reclaim this relationship with nature, but also because there's this really important piece that radical imagination plays in um, moving through life and changing what our reality is now. Um, so especially in the wake of all of the attacks on Asian elders and the rise of um, violence against the Asian community, I've definitely been considering what, how important it is to recognize what's going on, um, especially with how the Asian community tends to be just continues to shrink itself like in a space you want to shrink yourself you want to disappear you try and disappear to be accommodating and so how my work takes up so much space you know and how i create these worlds and um, what that means to me and so i've been really working on creating really multifaceted interdisciplinary pieces while i'm here um, and this piece is in the Ensika show that we just installed that Kayla was talking about earlier. And the title is All That You Touch You Change, um, which is part of a quote from Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, um, and which is also a reference to these sort of people who are see reading the reality to have this clarity of vision in envisioning futures. Um, Parable of the Sower is a dystopian novel. Um, yeah, so with that, I can transition to showing you some of the stuff that I'm doing here in the studio. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move my computer out of the frame and I'll be right back. Do we have any questions after the slideshow that you want to start with? You're not getting any? Oh, we're good. Great. Well, welcome to my space. Um, I've been really enjoying trying to fill it and rise to the occasion of filling it and filling a solo show here. Um, and I just wanted to show you some of the things that are in progress. So this is a similar piece to the one that's in the show. Um, this is not finished. So you can see all of the different paper pieces um, that are will then be attached to the ceramic. And this ceramic piece was created um, mainly by coil, coil building. And so I was coiling over um, a slump mold to create some sort of form. Um, and I have one that's just been bisqued. And so for me, I've really started to experiment with um, how I tie in these sort of batik paper forms into the ceramic itself. And part of that has been coiling um, shapes that are similar to them and then flattening them with my hand um, and really starting to make these sort of fragile moving pieces. Because for me, like thinking about clay right now, um, I'm really thinking about this act of creation and making and then unmaking and the instability of um, what the future looks like and what change looks like and that it's constantly moving and shifting and that's actually really encouraging. Um, but I've also been trying to reference that in some of the forms that I'm creating. So I took um, a ceramic piece like this 
And I have a vat of a fiber that's called Kozo. It's like the inner bark of the mulberry tree. And it's used primarily in Eastern um, paper making. And so I basically just fill a bucket with water with this fiber that I've pigmented. And then I drag the ceramic through it. So then it builds up these sort of soft layers um, of this long fiber. Can you talk about mm -hmm. the act of pouring and how that's significant for you? Yeah, I think. I mean, my relationship with all of my materials, I hope to be more of a collaboration than anything. And I think that's why I love clay as well, um, is the clay is very stubborn and has its own, you know, own way of wanting to move or what it wants to do before it structurally breaks down. And so with paper, it's also a similar way. And so I was, when pouring, I feel like I have both some control and also no control over where it's going um, and in thinking about how things grow um, it's really referencing how the material wants to move and grow to create these different shapes and forms yeah yeah so i've been really enjoying this is very new for me that i'm dragging the ceramic through the fiber itself um, and i've been enjoying the softness of kozo um, and how long the fibers are, they create these really webbed um, sort of areas on the pieces. And I feel like it's helping to start to integrate more of what the variety of paper making um, can do in collaboration with ceramic, um, since I've primarily only worked with overbead and abaca in, um, with the ceramic forms. So starting to branch out out there. Um, that's really exciting. I have a piece here that's in progress. So it's a larger version of these pieces that I'm showing. So this one's currently drying. You can see that it's on a mold and I start building with coils on top of that. And I'm really hoping that these become sort of large wall pieces for the show um, and start to have these different forms that come out from the wall as well as on the wall. So yeah, I don't know if anyone has any questions about how I make these. I have other things to show too. Uh, there's a question mm -hmm. about watching you work in your studio during mm -hmm. COVID? Yeah. Well, I can, one, we have set up on Inst the Instagram. I'm posting to the stories. There's now a highlight called In the Studio. Um, and I can show you at the end of the talk how to find that um, on the Instagram. So I'll be posting process things in the studio. Um, and then occasionally I'll just hop on a live stream if I'm doing something really interesting. If you have a request, like you're like, oh, I wanna see more about that process. Like next time you do that, do you mind like turning on a live stream? I'm happy to do that. Um, I just wanna be as accessible as possible considering that the community is not able to be in here with me and I don't get that energy of the back and forth talking with all of y'all. Great, thank you. Cool, are there other questions there? Would you ever make the well, I mean, you can make paper clays, but it burns out. So it just changes the sort of quality of the clay itself. It'll make it lighter. I haven't really worked with paper clay, mainly because I'm interested in the paper as its own um, body, you know, like a clay body, but for the paper to also be a, a body instead of um, just a part of the process, material process. Cool, so I can show you, these are just some of those, like while I'm here, different sort of pieces of the abaca that I've worked with. So it's really difficult to pull them up because they're, um, they're basically squirted onto 
a pellon, which is basically um, interfacing for clothing. And so then you have to peel them up. And the way that I work is really thin. So sometimes you get some that don't make it through that process. But um, it's exciting because I get this pile of colors through that. So I'm working with them from bottles like this, where I've been pigmenting the fiber. And so these will start to not just be a part of these wall pieces, but um, as you may have noticed, I work large sculpturally. And so I'm finding ways to integrate these into those as well. I have some pieces here in progress. Um, so this is bisqued. So I'm starting to work with the same sort of like fragile forms that like Im that imply movement in these sculptural pieces as well, um, which will eventually lead to some sort of combination of fiber um, and paper coming off of them. And I'm not exactly sure what that's going to look like yet. Um, I'm still sort of in the experimental stage of that, but they also will be partially glazed and have some I really enjoy working with um, a material that's really only technical term is gloop, where it's in between a um, self-glazing clay and a glaze. So it has more of a body. Um, and you basically just add mason stains for color in those. So in thinking about you know movement and dripping and you know this pouring, um, I'm also starting to work with that in glaze. And that's what um, I was experimenting with, but haven't yet like used on an act, on a piece. So that that's sort of the next step for me with these larger ceramic vessels. And I have a few more around that I can show if you want me to. Are there any questions? Yeah, there's a question about the color in the paper, the colors. Like where, where the pigmenting is coming from, or what the colors mean to me. Okay, um, so these are pigmented with um, their colorants that are over here. So I use Aardvark colors from Carriage House paper, um, and so I'm just using these to mix into. Um, into the fiber itself. So it takes on these bright colors. Um, and for me, color is important in terms of thinking about joy and thinking about how bright colors are related to how people have seen people of color um, and to Orientalism and these sort of things that um, mark, you know, color being needing to be confined um, within spaces. Um, and so it's sort of an explosion of that. And yeah, so other questions? Thank you. Um, there's a question from Vince. He's interested in quoting June Jordan and Octavia Butler. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about how literature is influencing your ceramic and fiber work? Is it inspirational or something else? Yeah, no, it's a huge part of my practice. Reading is like a huge part of me as a human to begin with. Um, but definitely in thinking about world building, I'm thinking about people who are um, doing that in other areas of art. So Octavia Butler is really important to me, just her clarity of vision around what is going on in her time and how she then uses that to create these worlds of the future um, or different situations um, and these sorts of moments of imagination. And so I read a lot of fantasy and I read a lot of sci-fi um, and my practice is really research based. Um, so I've done a lot of research, which is where the June Jordan poem came from, and Evelyn White and also just about, um, you know, landscape painting in 19th century. America and what that did um, and how that looked and what sort of implications that has for how we see what America is in relationship to the land. Um, other people I'm reading right now, I've been rereading Minor Feelings by Kathy Park Hong, 
um, which is all about, you know, and the Asian American experience and understanding that and taking up space now, um, which has been really great. And then been always revisiting Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what would your utopic world look like? And can you repeat that question? Um, so Kalo is asking, what would my utopic world look like? And my answer is, I don't know. Um, that's sort of what these pieces are, is just sort of throwing it out there, you know, and coming from my experience and trying to see truth in my world to create sort of explosions of things that could be a world, right, that could be a future. Um, and those are really important in hope and trying to make those futures happen. Um, so for me, I think the definition of what a utopia would look like is constantly changing based on our current realities. You know, like we're always having to do this healing work now um, and seeing more and more facets of what's going on in the world to understand what we need to do differently. Yeah, of course. Any other questions? Uh, will you be working as large scale as you did in your some of the previous work that you chose? Yeah, of course. So Kayla was asking if I'm going to be working as large scale as I have in the past. And the answer is yes. I'm not exactly sure how yet, um, because I don't want to just replicate the installation that I created before um, for my BFA, but I'm really thinking about these wall pieces becoming like a full scale wall piece um, and become sort of their own immersive environment as well as some sculptural pieces that are also large. Um, yeah. And um, will you be teaching here? Yeah, Kayla was asking if I will be teaching and I will be teaching a class. Um, it will be in May. And we're hoping that it's going to be a hybrid class so that there's a potential for some in person contact um, by then. And yeah, so I'll be excited to meet whoever is able to be in that class. Yeah, and like always feel free to reach out if you have questions that you think about later. Um, my Instagram is turmeric and clay and you're welcome to send me an email as well. Um, yeah. Um, do you have anything else you wanted to show us? <laughs> I mean, can see. Well, I thought before I was here, I was also doing these the loop tests. So I sometimes they sort of want to jump off of the the piece, or they drip. You know, they'll want to drip down and come off. And the exciting thing is that they're sort of they've got enough body; they become these. Um, sort of sculptural forms themselves. So these are sort of fun in that, um, yeah, and that those are gonna be coming from these soon. I don't know, is anyone seeing anything in the background that they want me to pull out? Yes, those things. Okay. There's a comment that the work is very stunning and Michelle says, they love the relationship between hard and soft, ephemeral and static. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Michelle is my paper making professor and really the reason why I'm making the work that I am right now. So um, these are the 3D doodles that I was making sort of orchid forms, which are one of the sort of imagery that you see in batiks. And then I was dragging them through vats of Kozo, like I'm doing with the ceramic fiber. And these came first, actually. So they're part of the reason I thought to do that. Um, and I'm hoping that some of this ends up being integrated in with the wall pieces as well, as those become more and more complex, because I am who I am, and I'm interdisciplinary. And I think that the more materials, the better, to be honest, you know, the more visual and textural information. Um, 
the more I'm excited. So, yeah. Um, just an observation from me, uh, you know, color, small pieces, repetition, I can't help but think of the word ornament or ornamentation. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little bit about your thoughts on that? Um, well, I, I hope you all heard Kayla's long thing, but she was asking about um, what my thoughts are on ornamentation in relationship to my work. And for me, I think part of ornamentation is this level of beauty, right? What are the things that make us joyful and excited in this world? And, and um, also, they, they tend to be a place that people have fun, you know, like people have fun making things sort of luscious or making, you know, patterns and um, adding that color and pattern and layers into into things that we wear, right, or things that are in our houses. And so I think that's important to me and my practice and thinking about like this role of beauty and that beauty is important um, and radical in some ways, you know, and yeah. Thank you. Um, this question is from Ashwini. She's a fellow South Asian maker. And one of the things she always thinks about is how to navigate cultural references without those references coming across as exotic. What is your viewpoint on that? Yeah, um, I think that's really what I'm, I've been reckoning with lately is that I just totally avoided them. You know, like um, I was using color as sort of this marker for, um, the color from my culture and you know the materials speaking to material histories but now i've been trying to figure out a way to sort of bring all of those things in you know and to be unapologetically who i am um in my work as well as me as a person as well as um you know framing that you know i think part of part of it is always how you frame it when you talk about it when you write about it um what other things are happening in in a piece along with it, because definitely there's a level of being exoticized constantly um, and things being exciting because they're, you know, exotic. And um, I hope that I'm just creating think worlds that speak primarily to people who are like me, you know, people who are people of color or might get these references and hopefully it just becomes an education for other people. Any more questions or does anyone want to unmute themselves and say hi? <laughs> yeah, Kayla was, Kayla was asking if there are any more questions or if people want to unmute themselves and have a party right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, happy to be here. Um, someone's going to nominate you for president. <laughs> Is that Megan? Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> He's got my GoPro. <laughs> um, can you talk about what you'll be teaching? Yeah, I'll be teaching um, a class about sort of hand building vessels and thinking about mixed media surfaces because that that is what I do with my work. Um, so it'll be coiling forms um, that are more organic shapes and then working on different versions. Everyone brings their own set of skills, right? Um, but I'll share some of mine with paper, how I work with paper, with ceramic, and how I've worked with beeswax and spices in the past, too. Um, so that's what I'll be teaching. And are you going to be teaching kids? Um, I don't know what the situation is in terms of that, but teaching is a really huge part of um, who I am and thinking about community is like I have all of these skills and part of my role is to share them, you know, um, and have taught kids in the past and will be teaching um, and working at the Oxbow School where Megan is um, this summer. So, yeah. I think you have a lot to share with youth, especially um, that are, have Asian heritage. I think you would be a 
great role model for them. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I think I, I have almost as much to learn from them um, and definitely having some really amazing kids and youth in my life as I have created a lot of this work has impacted how I how I'm able to play with materials. So Yeah. If people are going to unmute, I'll grab my computer so I can see everyone. So right now I'm just looking into the camera like, hello, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Oh. I think you have to mute the community center for me. Okay. No. Good to see everyone and get to see your faces since I've been just sort of talking to a camera this whole time. <laughs> Any other questions or comments or things people want to celebrate? What came first? Um, ceramics came first. Um, maybe fiber, possibly. I went to Interlochen Arts Academy, which is an arts high school um, in Michigan. And so I went there all four years. So um, I started working with ceramics as well as fiber my freshman year there. Oh, sound a bit okay. Should I just turn off my camera then? <laughs> like my triple camera. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Kelly. I look forward to seeing, seeing you and meeting you. It's so weird to be here and know that there's this amazing community at in Sonoma and everyone who uses the studio and that, that I'm not really getting to meet. Um, but I hope you feel free to reach out to me anytime. Have you ever been to China or Malaysia and has that influenced your work? Okay, yes, um, I've been to Malaysia. My family hasn't been, um, isn't from China except for like six generations ago. So like very little, you know, in terms of, um, relationship to specific places in China, but I went to Malaysia. Um, time is difficult now right after I graduated um, college. And so I think the shift in my work has been a lot to do about me feeling able to claim that experience now that I've been there and been to that place and been with family there. Um, so yeah, so I think it's really, it, it definitely shifted my practice. Thank you, everyone. Um, can you talk about what kind of clay you use and how spices are incorporated? <laughs> well, um, in, yeah, so Kayla was asking um, what sort of clay I use and how spices have been incorporated. Um, and I generally use spices in either diffusers or mixed into beeswax that have become a surface treatment for ceramic. Um, because I was thinking also about, you know, what am I creating in these multi-sensory spaces? And part of that has to do with smell um, and especially curry um, and the smells that it, it creates when it fills a space. Um, and um, in terms of clays, I'm, sort of in love with red clay bodies just because they start with pigment you know they they've got color of their own to begin with and since i primarily haven't used a lot of glazes um starting with some sort of color either through spray paint um or having it already in the clay body is really exciting to me 
um, but mainly it's just been whatever I have access to. Um, yeah, and thanks, Max, the previous artist in residence. I appreciate the legacy that you have left here. <laughs> and there are artists in my family, Molly. Um, I think there are more artists than they will um, they will say that there there are. Um, but actually, my great uncle is um, Hong Fu, who does large landscape paintings. Um, yeah, and there are more. There are many more. Um, yeah, and I'm grateful for the legacy of the seamstresses on the other side of my family as well. Did you always know you wanted to be an artist, or can you talk about like how you how you became an artist? Um, it's just I think the reality of who I am is the way that I process the world is through art, and that's just always been how I move through the world. Um, is collecting things and making making things, and um, yeah, and even even when I thought that I wanted to do other things, like I was. I actually went to Scripps College for a year to study environmental science. Um, it was to serve my art better. Like I was hoping to have like almost this whole other career so that I had more information to support art. Um, but while I was there, I realized when I'm not practicing art at a high level, I really have difficulty processing any other information in the world. Um, and I was struggling in my academic classes to pro like actually turn the things that I was learning into um, meaningful connections and it all started clicking when I started um, back at an art school so yeah <laughs> sorry I'm just reading comments and questions there's a question at the end yeah I'm so that says, I'll read the, the question out if people aren't looking at the chat. Um, it says, clay as a material holds within itself thousands of years of geological, ecological history and migration, and simultaneously in its present form is immediately malleable and responsive. How do you think about these multiple identities of clay within your work, if at all? Um, I think about this a lot, um, honestly, and Recently, I've been also thinking about the sort of mythological um, relationship that we as humans have with clay and it being this sort of material of creation, you know, and that it's something that people are, that original peoples were made out of, you know, and it has this long relationship with who we are and our identity as human beings and our placement in the world. And um, I think as someone who grew up moving around a lot and being mixed, clay is sort of like one of those constant homes for me. Um, Cause I didn't really have a place that I knew super well, um, but I've always had this relationship with natural spaces and with um, clay and making. And so that became sort of another home for me. Any other questions? <laughs> if you were a salad, what would you <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Lexi. It's a question from Lexi. Hi, Lexi. If I were a salad, what would I be? Um, I'd probably be some tongue which is the green papaya salad, because honestly, I'm not very good about eating salad. Um, I do like greens, but I like them cooked. Um, yeah, <laughs> any other sorts of questions or comments or things that anyone wants to talk about? I think it'll be so exciting to see how your work evolves here. And what would be the best way for people to keep up with your progress here? Yeah, so Kayla was asking how to keep up with my progress during this residency. 
And I think definitely um, Instagram is the best place, to be honest. Um, I will be posting on my Instagram, Turmeric and Clay, but also through the stories um, on so Sonoma Ceramics. But also like, you know, you can go to my website. It also has my email address. And like, I can't promise that I will be very timely in answering any emails. Um, but I will respond eventually, and I definitely see Instagram faster. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you all. It's great to see so many faces, even on the screen, so. Yes. Yep, <laughs> I'm all for a socially distant potluck, especially if it involves curry, always. We will certainly plan for one outside, maybe after daylight saving when it's later. Yeah. Great. Thank you all, and thanks for all of your support and welcome. Um, I really appreciate it. It's nice to be back here in, the, in California, so. Yeah, normally this would be a potluck. Yeah, <laughs> we'd all be sharing food and chatting. I'd appreciate that, but yeah, so. Yeah, here, let me grab my. So if there's no more questions, I think we'll wrap it up. You can pop in. Yep. I just wanted to say thanks everyone for coming and supporting our program, whether it's virtual or virtual. <laughs> but we do look forward to opening up when we can all get together sometime. And um, stay in touch through our social media channels. And um, if you have any questions about our program, feel free to email me, Kayla at Sonoma Community Center.org. Um, but be sure to keep in touch and and keep up with what Anel is doing. Um, I think she's gonna be doing some exciting work here. So we're so happy to have her. So lucky to have her. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm so grateful to be here. And like, this is such an amazing team and studio and space. And I, th I hope you all are like, continue to follow what if you aren't already a part of this community, follow what they're doing here at Sonoma Ceramics and in the community center in general. Um, I'm just so grateful to be a part of this team for a while. Yeah, and thank you all for coming and yeah, hope to see some of your faces soon, whether it's virtual or, you know, hopefully at some point in person masked. Yeah, thank you.